Welcome to my talk about entering the, enter the next level, migrating to cloud native platforms. When we think about cloud native platforms, we have certain things in mind. Normally, we think about cloud native, we think about architecture, so we mainly think about API gateways, service meshes. Sometimes we have a, an opinion about the people in the project regarding cloud native migrations. And afterwards, we are always thinking about observability, all the things behind that. So in this talk, we will just spot the different things around cloud native environments. So what is cloud native? Cloud native is about distributed systems. So when we look at the literature and find something from Scholl, Svensson, and Janosovic, a distributed system is a system in which individual computers are connected through a network and appear as a single computer. Total simple, totally simple. So when we go further, we enter something called the cap theorem which is about consistency, high availability, tolerance to network partitions, and so on. So it's more on this distributed thing. Normally, when you think about a cap theorem, you only will achieve two of the three ones. So main, mainly you will have consistency and high availability, or you will have consistency and tolerance to network partitions and so on. So this is what you can achieve. When we also think about cloud native, we got mentioned the 12 factor apps so often, but what is a 12 factor app? A 12 factor app consists of 12 steps to develop an app. You have a one code base, you have isolated and explicitly declared dependencies, you store configuration in the environment, and so on and so on. And you even think about concurrency, logs, admin processes, and so on. When we also think further about cloud native, we mainly hit containers. Containers are everywhere. So even on the picture, you see a lot of containers. So when we get into an adoption to what we call cloud native, all of these containers on the picture can have something like a little application or a bigger application and so on. So when we have this container things, we need something to orchestrate them. So we need orchestration. And when we think about orchestration, we want to provision and deploy these containers. We want to talk about resource management, health monitoring, scaling, providing mappings to connect to networks. And even we will think about load balancing. And the one thing we have when we think about orchestration is everybody talks about Kubernetes. Kubernetes was open sourced by Google in, 19, in 2013 and every cloud provider has a Kubernetes offering. So it's mainly a standard. So normally when you talk about Kubernetes, you always think about AWS, Google and Azure and what they offer for this purpose. But what is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is just a deployment of container, uh, containers in pods which are connected to a replica set and when a request comes in a service connects to the containers in, a, in the pod or to the pod and so there is always this part which normally is not seen on the other side. But even when we think about cloud native, we saw we have Kubernetes as an environment. So we have to get into this environment. So we think about 
how to get there. The easiest and sometimes the hardest part is lift and shift. What does this mean? We talk about infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. So when we do lift and shift, we sometimes use infrastructure as a service or we use a whole platform as a service to do this lift and shift and hopefully in an easy way. But when we also think about cloud native, we think about application modernization. We want to modernize our application, which might be old, might be a le legacy solution, and so on. And why want, uh, we are talking about application modernization is also quite easy. We want faster deployments. We want, or we have some components that need to be updated more frequently. We have components that need different scaling requirements. And maybe we have some components that should be developed in different technology than the others. And even we think about application modernization when the code base is too big and too complex to handle. Normally, when we think about modernization steps, we have always patterns in mind. So when we think about application modernization, we talk about the strangler pattern or we have an anti-corruption layer pattern to avoid problems with the data. So this is what comes apart when we think about application modernization as part of cloud native. And the third part when you think about cloud native and not even technology, but concepts, we always think about microservices, but why? Normally microservices are quite small, loosely coupled and focused on their area of functionality. So everything becomes smaller, no bigger code bases and so on. We get straight through and have a little, little world of microservices. But that's, it's quite harder to handle. When we have a lot of microservices, we have little code bases, but we have a lot of them. So we need something to handle these microservices, even in this migration to the new cloud native world. So what comes up first is something like an API gateway. But what is an API gateway? An API gateway is when we look at patterns at, the fir at first a facade, which is only there to masking complex and under uh, complex underlying or structural code. So we want to hide something from others. But when we get to new definitions of API gateway, we mainly meet We mainly meet Chris Richardson and Chris has a good definition of an API gateway. An API gateway is a simple entry point for all clients. It can be handled in two ways, for proxying or routing or fanning out multiple services. So when we look at this definition, we find an API gateway is a solution for at first routing where well, we have a client and the gateway in the middle and we have a lot of services behind the gateway and the gateway handles the routing to the services from the client on the other side with an api gateway we have a solution for aggregation aggregation means we have this gateway and we have a client and the client calls the gateway or the endpoint of a gateway and the gateway begins to aggregate over different services and sends the response back to the client. But when we think about this aggregation pattern, it's quite yeah, complex. It's getting business logic into an, a gateway. So maybe this is not the, good uh, the best choice. When we think about the aggregation pattern in a different way, we can think about having the gateway and at first an aggregation service 
between the services and the gateway. So the gateway communicates with the aggregation service and not with the services directly. So all the business logic is not part of the gateway. We have still this gateway possibility and we can change the API gateway all the time. Maybe when there are security issues and so on, so we can change the component in our architecture quite easily. The third solution is offloading and cross-cutting concerns. What does that mean? Normally when we have services, they have authentication, authorization, they need rate limiting, retry policies. We have to think about circuit breaking, caching, compression, SSL offloading and, and logging, including monitoring. So these cross-cutting concerns or offloading features can't be placed into the gateway. And the gateway uses the cross-cutting concerns to spread them all over the services behind the gateway. So we only configure this cross-cutting concerns at one place and use the cross-cutting concerns via plugins or add-ons with the services and provide the, the, these informations to the services via the gateway. When we are in a Kubernetes uh, universe, we have always an ingress and an egress. So something co comes into the Kubernetes cluster and something goes out. And we can place an API gateway up front as an ingress controller and even also as an egress controller. And egress gateways deal with traffic entering the system and do tasks like routing or offloading. But when we have a gateway as an egress controller, we control the traffic that exits the system. And when we have a look at the whole scape of architecture, we see we talked about services outside the cluster we are in. So we have conversation to the cluster and out of the cluster. But what is with the conversation inside the cluster. There we have another, uh, I would not call it pattern, I would call it component. We have the service mesh. Normally we have different services, maybe in different languages, and we have the code of the service and each service needs some communication code to communicate with other services. So this communication code is always placed in the same service. But this, may, this makes it quite complex and quite uh, not so handy to uh, give it all what you need. When you think about good architecture, you might think about a sidecar or a proxy where all the communication code between the services is part of the proxy, not part of the service. So we have this Java service on, on the one side and the Python service on the other side, and they both use nearly the same proxy, which is coupled to the service of each. So, and the communication takes place between the service and the proxy and the proxies for the services. When we think about this in a higher level, we have a so-called control plane and we have this data plan. So we can have different services in different data plans or different clusters. And they all can communicate between, uh, because of the proxies placed in the data plans who are connected to the control plan. This is the normal Architecture, uh, architecture diagram, which we saw when we talk about service meshes. So when we think about a service mesh, what do we really need? Yeah, there are some, some things like cross-cutting concerns. We want to talk about traffic management. 
failure handling, security, tracing and monitoring. And these are the features we can provide through the proxy within the cluster for the communication between the services in the cluster. So we can manage traffic, we can manage fail failure handling, we can manage the security within the proxy and also tracing monitoring. And when we think about, again, the gateway, we have the possibility to combine the service mesh with the gateway and have all the things like security delivered from the gateway to the service mesh control plan to have all the features at one place. So this is yeah, some kind of technology or pattern side of cloud native um, migrations, but we should also talk about people. I say people, some people might be irritated that I'm not talking about resources, but we are talking about real people doing real projects. So when we think about people, always DevOps comes, comes up. But what is DevOps? DevOps is a broad concept with goals to make it quite easy in the definition. It, is, it should improve collaboration between development and operation. It should also improve the deployment frequency. And the teams should achieve faster times to market and even lower failure rates of new releases and the lead time between fixes should be also shortened and DevOps should improve the mean time to recover so that the system is in a real fast time available again. These are some points about DevOps. We have this broad concept and we have this improvement of collaboration between you know, roles in a development team. So there is a lot of conversation between people and it should be improved even more. And through this, we achieve all the other things. But how can we measure something like DevOps? Because everybody's talking about DevOps. You should do this, you should do that, and you should build, uh, build pipelines to, to get a better understanding of DevOps and do all the things. We are always talking about tools when we, when we think about DevOps, but DevOps is really about the people. So we need something to, to measure our yeah, milestones or something like that, just to get on to see, did we achieve something or didn't we? And one thing about measurements, there comes up the model of CALMS. But what is CALMS? It's about collaboration, automation, lean principles and processes, measurement, and sharing. So the CALMS model helps us to, to deliver DevOps in a more appropriate way. We should collaborate. All the people involved in a development or migration process should collaborate, should talk. In the end, they should share all their knowledge. And to achieve this DevOps model, automation is a need. We should automate as much as possible. Not 100%, but nearly 70 or 80% should be automated of all the tasks we do to deliver software or to do migrations to the cloud. Even so, we we've should think about lean principles and processes. So everything should be, has some kind of agile. So really small packages, a lot of iterations to go through and a lot of learning processes. Even you can do 
or you can have failures in your processes. You just should learn about it. And on the third step, we have this measurement. We need some KPIs to measure. And we learned how we things can be achieved or improved. So this should be something we, we can measure. And after all this, we have this sharing option. So, so we should share our knowledge. We had in a project where we did a migration to, to the cloud and our application become cloud native. So we have a lot of sharing with other people. And when we think about all this DevOps, normally a CI CD flow comes up. This is just an example where we have, it's quite complex where we have to complete the code, put it to Git and then go through all the steps, build container, containers, put, push these containers into the private registry, do a security scanning, test the configuration and so on. After a lot of steps, we get a release or we just have a canary test and so on. So this is a whole complex CI CD flow we see here where we have all the things behind the DevOps concept. And even when we put the cons model on it, we see here are a lot of, of learnings in it. So the process started nearly small and it got bigger and bigger. So everything like deployment to uh, Kubernetes shouldn't be, a, no, uh, shouldn't be an, a manual step. It will be an automated proce process. So when we think about all the, the things we, we achieved, we migrated to the cloud and now our applications or our application runs in the cloud. What is next? The next thing is observability. Observability is about all the things which comes from the systems we monitor. We, we achieve observability when we made data available from the systems. And monitoring, what we all like to do is the actual step of just collecting and displaying it. So we, are, we need to do observability. We need to make the data available from all the systems, all the applications in our cloud environment to get into a monitoring phase to monitor all the applications, all the systems. And after that, when we look at this pyramid of power, we have to do an ana analysis. We have to analyze the data we monitored so that we have all the capabilities to have all the information to deliver better software. Because when we do this in, in, in this way, having a look at the pyramid of power, we can do some call it data-driven development. So we get all the information from the gateway, from the services, we combine them, we monitor, we do analysis about all the things, maybe how APIs were used by external clients and so on. And with this information, we can build even better software to get to the next level of software development. Thank you for joining my session about cloud native migrations, entering the next level by migrating to the cloud. There will be a um, Q&A session afterwards, so please stay tuned and ask the questions you have. Thank you.